Um, this summer, we're doing a few things new. Um, we are doing a little bit of teaching within the service. Um, this came out of some studies that I did um, this last month um, at a preaching conference about how today the opportunities and the time for people to be involved in Bible study is its different than it used to be. Um, people just aren't as involved other than Sunday morning. And so an option is to add some teaching into the worship service. So we're trying that. We're going to be doing an introduction to the gospel. Um, and then as the summer goes on, we may add other introductions to the other readings so that when we hear from the Hebrew scriptures or we hear from the Psalms or we hear from the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, that we can place those scriptures kind of in their setting in our minds and we can understand the people to whom they were being spoken. Um, the other thing that um, is a little different is that we will hear some fresh translations. Um, today we heard at the Acts reading in the message, the Good News um, version of the Bible. We'll be hearing some other versions than we are accustomed to, perhaps, um, in worship. Um, part of the reason for that is to give us a, a hearing of these um, passages that is as close as we can come to how the original hearers would have heard them, not so much through our English language lens, but that's not the right word, but I think you know what I mean. And so the introduction today to the gospel is this. The gospel of John, the fourth and latest recording of the gospels, dating late in the first century, is appointed for most of the primary festivals of the liturgical year. Regardless of which of the other, other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, are appointed for the other Sundays. Now, you probably have, are aware that this is the year of Luke, from last Advent and December all the way through November this year. We will mainly be hearing from the Gospel writer Luke. Except on festivals, of which today is one. John's gospel informs most of our Trinitarian theology. That is our understanding of God as three in one. And this excerpt from Jesus' farewell discourses to his disciples is a really good example that we'll hear today. Abba, God, experienced in the life of Jesus, is now operative through the spirit of truth. Another thing we'll hear in the, in the gospel today is the phrase, in my name. And that means under the authority of. Did you ever wonder what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? Under the authority of Jesus. Another term you may or may not be familiar with, paraclete, not parakeet, paraclete. It's a Greek term for one's advocate in court, a legal mediator. And it's interesting that advocate, this paraclete word, is a divine title that is only found in the New Testament, or in the New Testament, it's only found in John's writings. So the passage that we will hear conveys to these first late century community of Christians, that although Jesus is no longer present with them, God's power through the Spirit is. And so now I invite you to stand again as you are able, and we will sing Ale. St. John says, Rabbi, Philip said, show us Abba God, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen Abba God. How can you say, show us your Abba? 
Don't you believe I am in Abba God and God is in me? The words I speak are not spoken of myself. It is Abba God living in me who is accomplishing the works. Believe me that I am in God and God is in me. Or else believe because of the works I do. The truth of the matter is anyone who has faith in me will do the works I do. And greater works besides. Why? Because I go to Abba God, and whatever you ask in my name, I will do, so that God may be glorified in me. Anything you ask in my name, I will do. If you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another paraclete, another helper, to be with you always the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot accept, since the world neither sees her nor recognizes her. But you can recognize the spirit, because she remains with you and will be within you. These are the words of Jesus. You may be seated. So today we celebrate the day of Pentecost. We celebrate with all Christians on earth that event that occurred 2,000 years ago when Jesus fulfilled his promise to send the Holy Spirit to the disciples, the disciples who were feeling left orphaned in this world after his death on the cross. The Spirit came to comfort those disciples as they were facing a hostile world. The Spirit comes to comfort us, too, in a hate-filled and godless world in which we also sometimes find ourselves. But not only comfort. The Spirit was and is also an advisor, a helper, a counselor, on how we are to be led. How are we to lead others to the truth, the whole truth? This Holy Spirit is a guide, reveals sin, shows us what is wrong in our world. Jesus will reveal a few chapters later in John's Gospel that the Spirit indicates what is the path of peace, of justice, of love. We might wonder what happened. What happened on Pentecost? In simple words, with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the small group of disciples who were filled with fear, they were filled with hidden in the dark fear. So filled with fear. These fear-filled disciples became the church. From fear to open testimony. This is the action of the Spirit. This is the action of the Holy Spirit. That's why on many occasions it is stated that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Well, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures, the first Pentecost festival was an agrarian festival in which the beginning of the harvest was celebrated. The Feast of Pentecost celebrated the joy, the rejoicing of starting to harvest what with so much work the laborers had planted and cared for. After work, effort, and waiting comes the harvest day. Pentecost wasn't only the celebration of joy and rejoicing, but above all, it was a feast of thanksgiving to Yahweh to Yahweh for the blessings. How was Yahweh thanked? How was Yahweh thanked for these blessings? By giving Yahweh the first fruits of the harvest, the first fruits of what the earth had produced. So if wheat were planted in the field, the first harvested wheat was given to Yahweh. 
So what then is the relationship between this agricultural festival and the Christian Pentecost? We could perhaps think of Pentecost not as the birthday of the church, but as the feast of the beginning of the harvest of the church. The harvest of the church for the kingdom of God. A new life, that new way established, initiated by Jesus. If we go back to our Bibles and we reread the book of Acts, we see that the church began its missionary work only after the Pentecost event. Through Jesus and the action of the Holy Spirit, this is a time to celebrate with joy, the joy of seeing how the kingdom of God begins to grow. Reaping for eternal life and salvation, all who receive the word by faith. The Holy Spirit stirs us up. It unsettles us, even as the earth is disturbed so that seed can be planted and fruits of that planting can be harvested. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus, before undertaking the way of the cross, shares with his disciples the promise of the coming paraclete, of the helper, the advocate, within the farewell speech of Jesus. This is the first in John's Gospel of five different discourses of Jesus, all on the action of the Holy Spirit. So we hear Philip. We hear Philip, who when Jesus speaks to them of his special relationship with his Abba, Philip says, show us Abba God. That will be enough for us. Do we understand what Philip is asking of Jesus? Philip is merely asking Jesus for a sign that shows him God. Philip expects to see and experience a theophany of Yahweh, to use the Hebrew term for God, just as been done for Moses. Pillars of cloud and fire. Philip asks to have and re- to have to receive a miraculous and amazing sign. As we often want signs to show us why we should believe. Even in coming to worship, we sometimes insist that we be shown something, something miraculous, something amazing. But listen again to what Jesus says to Philip. He says, have I been with you all this time and still you do not believe? Jesus exhorts Philip and with Philip the rest of the disciples and through them to the whole church of all times not to seek out glorious and visual experiences and even less a direct special revelation from God or a union direct with God. They shouldn't seek the great, the miraculous, the supernatural, but they are exhorted to stand firm in faith in Jesus and in Jesus' word. In Jesus, in his words and actions, we see the words and actions of God. If we want to see what God is like, how God speaks and how God acts, then we see Jesus. We then hear the promise that the disciples will do greater works than Jesus himself. And Jesus affirms and emphatically certifies that everything that is asked in prayer, he without the slightest doubt will do. We misunderstand Jesus if we equate his promise with, for example, the fabled Aladdin lamp, which we only need to rub and wish. Jesus isn't talking about acquiring riches for ourselves or power or prestige. The context of these verses, these words of Jesus, is missional. Jesus has a has in view the future missionary work of the disciples when 
Jesus is not physically present any longer. The greatest works are and will be the wide overflow of the liberating, the healing, the saving forces of God on humanity and on the whole world. In other words, the greatest works that the disciples do will be based on the redeeming work that Jesus has already done on the cross and his resurrection. It's as if Jesus told them and us, In and for the development of your mission in the world, ask for what you want and I will do it. This is the same thing Jesus says in Matthew's gospel. There he says it this way. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, the righteousness of God, and all these things will be added to you. So Jesus knew Jesus knew that his disciples needed a change of focus. They needed a new heart for mission. And I believe he knows we need it too. Let us learn to celebrate the day of Pentecost by learning the way with Jesus, who has gifted us with his Holy Spirit. It remains to be hoped that this spirit will inflame all people, Christian, non-Christian, will eliminate from our midst all that hinders our lives and make us a Lutheran church, as a Lutheran church, authentically Pentecostal, that is, spirit-filled, spirit-comforted, spirit-driven, spirit-empowered. And so I say, let us pray for this breath of fresh air, shall we? Amen.